Hi there, I'm Samuel Henry. I am a member of the SB909 work group, which is the group, as I'm sure uh, Representative Cannon has explained to you, is uh, where the OEIB is at this point. I'm also a member of the State School Board um, of Education, and uh, I'm an ex officio member of the Oregon Commission on Children and Families, which I chaired for uh, six years and have been a member for, for nine years. Um, in my day job, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm a faculty member in the Graduate School of Education and uh, have been here since uh, 1992 when I was uh, lured away to do something called the um, Portland Education Network, which um, was designed to be a seamless sounds familiar, approach to um, education uh, uh, pre-K through uh, community colleges. So um, I'm going to try in about three minutes to um, provoke you actually uh, because I sometimes do that. Um, and I'm going to provoke you first of all um, by, by saying that I don't any of my colleagues uh, who have been nominated and we have testified but we have not been confirmed um, have, uh, have preset notions about um, what we're going to do but that is also um, there's a framework and uh, what works out I think is, is a part of the uh, social process. Um, when, I, when I went to try to uh, deal with the question because I do like to sometimes deal with the question that's asked. Um, how are we going to maintain the quality of education? Um, three things struck me. Number one was that it presumes that there's already a quality there. Um, and, uh, and sorry, but I'm one of those skeptics um, who received a liberal arts education. Um, so I don't always presume that there's a quality there. And, uh, and in fact, I think we need to continue to ask questions about whether there's a quality there. And sometimes those questions are about some of the ones that I've heard from the two colleagues that I did walk in on. And by the way, I was sitting on the band field. There was a big uh, crash up and, and we have our tribal ritual dance of edging along. Um, that back to quality is, uh, it's made, it's made in what we do. I've been looking at some recent research, um, and I've got two, two uh, friends and colleagues who uh, supply me lots of uh, recent readings and research, um, and uh, they are uh, Randy Hitz and Pat Burke, and some of you, oh yeah, I think um, might know them, and there's some research that says that the most successful school reform has been school reform, and they're talking about K through 12, and they're looking at multiple studies has been that reform that's attended to both human capital and, and social capital. And so, when I reflect on that, I wonder what is our social capital and what is our quality for that. Um, and, pardon me, but I, I wonder where is our social capital uh, as leaders in this community when 60,000 kids suffer child abuse and neglect, and how do we connect with that per year in the state of Oregon? Um, and how do we connect with that, and how do we face that in terms of providing leadership that's really quality driven? Um, I wonder about the kids in, in uh, Northeast or other parts of the metro area who um, never have a chance to get to uh, Portland State or any other uh, institution of higher education um, because of the barriers that we put in their pathways. Uh, barriers that we haven't found ourselves comfortable of taking a look at. I know that our chancellor sitting here has um, lobbied for, and our president has developed lobbied for, changing the legislation allowing students who attend college, I'm sorry, attend uh, high school in, uh, in Oregon to um, have in-state tuition. But we have far too many of uh, students who come from backgrounds um, where, uh, particularly from Latin America, who do not have that kind of access. We know that in 11 states where it's been tried, it has been rather successful. So my questions are about how do we define this success and how do we talk about the quality of what we've got. 
And um, if you forgive me, it drove me back to rereading some parts of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I don't know if that's been mentioned here. Um, uh, no, okay. Well, let me throw it out there for you. Um, it, it's a really good look at what quality is. Um, written by Robert Piercy, I think 1974. Um, you can tell when I was in graduate school. And, um, and it really asks this question of, of how do you know what quality is and how do you identify that quality. And so I'm going to throw out to you that, um, that we need to talk about quality in higher education as an intersection of a couple of things. Reform, refraction, and redemption. Okay? So in, in reform, I'm, I'm suggesting that it may be legitimately asked, where is the higher education that we can conceive of and organize so that it meets the communal desire to build human and social capital? Where do we endeavor to go to have a place where the real uh, questions of our society are dealt with, where they're met, where, they're, where um, there's the adequate attempt to research them, and the attempt to help provide some of the kinds of answers that we're always struggling for. So for me, that's, that's the, a piece of the reform. The, the second is refraction, and I use refraction because I started out as a physics minor. Um, and refraction is much more applicable than reflection in which the uh, light coming through the matter is returned immediately. And refraction is where part of it is internalized and part of it is returned, but I don't expect you to get into that. Um, but uh, I'll use refraction um, so that one of the questions is, where is that higher education? Uh, um, I'm sorry, not reflection. It pertains to an ask, how do we mobilize the kinds of resources necessary for strategic and meaningful results? And I think part of what has been attempted in uh, SB 909 and the setting up of the investment board is to really do that refraction and answer that question of mobilizing the kinds of resources that are necessary. Now, most of our reflection as educators has been, we just don't have enough money. And I don't deny that. But there are also questions to be asked about how we do what we do. And I think that is a, an able and noble pursuit in a very short amount of time. Um, our governor faced us on last Monday and reminded us that we had 55 days in which to uh, deliver some of the products that are necessary. Um, I'm hoping that we can do a phase one and, and come up with some of what, uh, what we need to do in terms of that question. And then, if you permit me, uh, Grasshopper, we need to ask about redemption. Um, we need to ask about the question in whose interest is higher education function? And why doesn't higher education better attend to those persons who are least enfranchised rather than those most poised to squeeze and take advantage of the present system? And to me, that is one of the ample reasons that we need to go back and redo, or even better, do again, uh, the structure and the emphases that we've taken. It's one of the reasons that I, at the ripe old age of 64, is a, uh, want to take a look and see why is an education doing a better job. Let me just say one more thing and then pass the torch on to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Francisconi. And I didn't mean to stumble on that. Um, and, and say that when I was in high school, and I know this is eons and eons ago, but I looked around and I, and I realized something was wrong. Now, I was 16 years old, and, and there are other kinds of you know, factors in that. I did grow up in Washington, D.C. Um, so you can say that I was certainly subject to lots of messages about public life. Um, but I looked around and my high school wasn't working. It wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for my, my good buddy Byron. It um, wasn't work, working for me because I was a gifted and talented kid. And if it hadn't been for some teachers, including Mrs. Davidson, who decided that Samuel needed to do a report every week on the new unit that they were studying as a way of layering in and scaffolding in and building that quality in high school, that I probably would have been lost. And there are all kinds of ways to get lost when you're in an urban high school with 2,700 kids. I did not choose any of those, although I saw a fair amount. But what was of more importance to me 
was my friend Byron. And Byron is still my friend. Um, we have known each other since we were six years old. I spoke to him three days ago. High school was not working for him. Now, he managed to plug it out. He, at one point, did go to a community college for about a year, but the community college didn't meet his needs. He served with distinguished service, uh, including uh, Purple Heart in, in Vietnam. He was 28 years on the D.C. police uh, force and on the marshal service, and he is now sort of, I think, contemplating uh, a retirement from, from that uh, venue. <coughs> For me, our higher education mission has to be connected with the mission of pre-K through postdoc. It is not just a narrow piece. It is not to be siloed. It is something that we all need to participate with each other in creating and aiming towards something better. I was listening to NPR because I was stuck in traffic again. Um, and they were, they were interviewing a, a a writer who was talking about how, um, actually it wasn't a writer, I'm sorry, it was in the news, and they were talking about the crisis in Greece, and uh, one of the pieces from the crisis in Greece was that this uh, person was talking about how Greece invented democracy. And um, that made me think, because one of the things I teach is that democracy was also invented simultaneously in several other places, including North America, and that in fact some of what we borrowed uh, was not something borrowed from the Greeks, but it was borrowed from the Iroquois nation. So it made me kind of look back at what is this success and what do we teach and how do we measure the outcomes in ways that are pluralistic, in ways that benefit all, and in ways that we can talk about a new kind of conversation with each other.